Hukki, Edaniku Enkki. In the Blackfoot speaking language, I just said, my name is Singer. That's my Blackfoot name. That's a name that comes from my grandfather to my great grandfather, so it's been in my family for generations. So now it's my name, and one day I'll pass it on to a member of my family. So my given name, or my colonist name, or Christian name, whatever you want to call it, is Grant Many Heads. So if you want to contact me, it's perfectly fine to contact me at either or. Call me Grant or call me Enkhi, and I'll respond. Well, anyways, today we're going to talk about the dog days. Now, in the Blackwood language, we say, Ito tasi mapi imi takes, or in the days, I guess that would roughly translate to in the days when we use dogs to move camp. So if you want, it was shortened to the dog days. So we'll speak of that time as the dog days, or ito tasi mapi imi takes. But actually, let's move on to the next screen, the next first image. Now before we actually get into talking about uh, the dog days, we have to know who this applies to. So we're talking today about the Siksikaitsi Tepiks, the Blackfoot speaking peoples. Now, okay, at the moment we're kind of having a, just a little uh, we're technical issue. Uh, we'll deal with that in a second, but I can speak a little bit to uh, what I was just speaking to. Now, in the dog days, Itota Simapi, this was basically the beginning of the Blackfoot people's existence. So since the, that time, our people over thousands, literally over thousands of years, figured out how to hunt Ini here on the Northern Plains. So now I think, uh, is our technical issue okay here? Yeah. Okay, so let's actually start with the first image. So here we have a dog and he's carrying are dragging what looks like a bag on a stick and that's actually two sticks one on each side of that dog but that contraption we know today by the French word travois so that's a dog travois a dog sled basically so let's move to the first image I was actually speaking of who does this apply to well today we're going to be speaking about the six gates at the beaks or the Blackfoot speaking peoples and today we have four tribes, or four First Nations in North America that make up the Siksikaitsi Tepiks. So if you look at those flags, the first one we have there is the Agena, Agena, the blood tribe. And then the second flag is the Siksika. The third one we have there is for the Pikani, or the Apatuisi Pikani, or those ones that live up north. Skinny Pikani, Skinny Pikani, that's the tribe that lives here in Canada. Now the fourth flag are the same people but we call them Amskapi Pikani because they live across the border or across the line and in the states they're known as the Blackfeet which is a misnamer because they're not Blackfeet they're actually Pikani which has an entirely different meaning. Pikani actually means uh, shabby robes or something along those lines. But anyway these four tribes that you're looking at these four flags, they represent who the Siksikaitsi the are today. Now if we look at the next image, you can see the traditional images for these tribes and you can see them there in the circle of the, the Siksikaitsi to be. In some circles are, we're also known as the Blackfoot Confederacy, but these are the four tribes that make up the Blackfoot speaking peoples. And this is who we're going to be talking about today. Now if we look at the next image, here we go. You can see some people on foot here. Well, you know, the Siksikaiti Tepi are the Blackfoot speaking peoples. We were, we were first the people without horses. Everything we did was on foot. We were pedestrian. We walked all over our lands. So we would go from place to place on foot, and the only beast of burden we had were dogs. But in our language, we call them Imita. And to us, Imita are sacred. They're sacred animals. Even how we received them. The, the ancient stories tell us that they came out of the water like a gift from the uh, Siita Beaks. And in our language, Siita Beaks basically means those water people, underwater people, the people that live in the water. And that could include any of the mammals or the animals that live in waters and lakes. So 
we believe that imita was given to us as a gift. And so our people use this animal to carry our burdens from one place to another. Now in those days we didn't travel very far and the dogs themselves were bigger than the domestic dogs you see in North America. Like those range from chihuahuas, little dogs, all the way up to the big dogs. But the dogs that the Blackfoot used were more wolf-like. They had more uh, of that wolf blood. So they would have been probably the size of a coyote or maybe a little bit bigger. But these dogs could carry 80 to 100 pounds. They could carry that across the plains. So in those days, most of our people would probably have uh, five to 10 dogs that they owned. And then they would use these dogs to move camp with the uh, wooden travel. And by the way, I just wanted to point out, because I may forget as we go along in the program here, but the poles that the Blackfoot used for our nitoyis, for our, what people call teepees, but in our language, we didn't have teepees, because that's actually a Sioux word. We called our homes nitoyis, and we believe that we were, our mothers and grandmothers are the ones who invented this sort of way of living. And so those poles in the dog days were made of birch. And those same poles that you put on the back of the dog were the same poles that when you arrived at your destination, you would use that to set up your, your teepee, your camp. So, are your nitoyis. And the Blackfoot always used four poles, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So in the dog days, our people wandered all over our lands without the use of the horse, and the dog was our beast of burden. And we were pedestrians, so we were on foot. So uh, let's look at the next image. Okay, so here we have an uh, image of the Blackfoot lands. And in our language, we say kitawas, and, and that is the name for our land, collectively, as Blackfoot-speaking peoples. Now, kitawas nani basically translates to, we are the people of the land of the buffalo, our ini. So our ancient stories, they tell us that we were given this land by Apistadoki, or Itzabeta Biopa. And that kind of translates to like the creator and the essence of life. So our people believed that the land that we were living on was given to us as a gift and it was our duty to live off of it, but also to sustain it, to protect it, to look after the lands that we lived in. So that's why we're even taught traditionally not even to break the branches off of a berry tree, because if you break that berry tree branch, well then, who's gonna be able to enjoy it in the years to come? So these things were sacred, and our people really took a lot of these things into consideration. So if we move on to the next image, Now these same ancient stories, they tell us that Ini, or what people know as the plains bison or the buffalo, that this was created as a gift for our people. So our people believe that it's a beta biopa, the creator of all things, made this particular animal just for us. And we also believe that this animal, in the ancient stories, he actually volunteered to help us. And so that's a, a long story, and if you want to know more about it, then maybe you I um, mean, we can talk to an elder or another knowledge keeper, but that's a story for another day. Now, our stories reflect many sacred sites throughout our, our vast territory. And so, this is just one of them. So, our people, we've always believed we were buffalo people. I've stated in other programs that as Blackfoot people, we have no migration stories amongst ourselves, our own history. We don't have stories of us coming from one place or another. But our stories are, we have always been here on our lands. So let's look at the next image. Now here we see the Blackfoot territory, all in the, uh, the yellowed area. And you can see how huge this area is. And it wasn't defined so much by the Blackfoot people, but as I mentioned, by Ini, because all of this yellowed area is all northern plains. When you go past the North Saskatchewan River, you're going into bushland or woodland. And there's buffalo that live up there and little pockets of plains bison. But for the most part, they're wood buffalo. And this is not what the Blackfoot hunted. We hunted the plains bison. So the plains bison's habitat was basically, in the northern parts of uh, the continent, was that yellowed area. 
And these were what some fur traders were curd, uh, uh, referred to as Saskatchewan buffalo, northern, northern herds. So let's actually look at the next image. So as we already spoke in Eni, the buffalo are the bison, the plains bison. Well, this creature, this animal, was our staff of life because it provided for the Siksigeti, the beaks, the Blackfoot-speaking peoples, our food, our winter clothing and bedding and shelter. And also it had hundreds of other uses to the Siksigeti, the bee. So, so long as this animal existed in its herds, its millions, our people had no want because so long as we followed this animal and hunted it, it provided everything that we needed. And so our people were content. And the thing is the buffalo as, a, as our food was our mainstay. This is what we would eat practically every day. But that's not to say we wouldn't balance our diet with other four-legged creatures that ate grass and had a split hoof, such as moose, deer, antelope, mountain sheep, mountain goats. Animals such as these were also part of the Blackfoot diet. But for the most part, this was our stop of life. Wherever this animal wandered, we followed. So you can go to the next image. So wherever the great northern herds roamed, our people followed them, like I mentioned. So our homeland, Kitawasin, was defined by Ini, by the bison or the buffalo. So let's move on to the next image. Here we have another picture of the Blackfoot lands, what we considered our homeland. And I just kind of like to point out, this is what the Blackfoot considered our homeland. But that's not to say that there weren't Blackfoot living on the other side of the mountains. Some of them were living in areas like the Bitterroot Valley, which is near present-day Missoula, Montana, United States of America. And then there were also Blackfoot living in the Tobacco Plains, where the Crow's Nest passes. And then there was Blackfoot living on the west side of the mountains, in Invermere, all the way up to the uh, Banff, all the way up to like House Pass, up to Jasper. There were Blackfoot living in the mountains, as well as on the eastern slope. So from there, all the way out, almost to the Manitoba Escarpment, and from the North Saskatchewan all the way down to the Yellowstone, this is what the Blackfoot considered our homeland. But like I mentioned, there was also stories of Blackfoot being beyond those particular sort of borders. And in fact, we've had tribes as much as 700, and this is historical, 100 tribes, 700 tribes, traveling all the way down to the Samaran River, near present-day Oklahoma, to join our Arapaho and Groven friends at one time when uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, problems going on. So our people joined with our allies down there. And we have those oral history to back that up. And there's written history from Ben's Fort regarding that same incident, about 1825, I believe. So the Blackfoot, we knew our lands very well. And that's because of the, what we call the Old North Trail, which literally runs from the Yukon all the way down to Mexico. And through this trail, our people knew our lands and knew our neighbors. And that trail actually kind of goes uh, 100 miles uniform distance from the mountain, past the foothills, onto the plains. And this trail runs past present-day Calgary, or McGinstis in the Blackwood language, all along the number two highway, going all the way down to past Coots, all the way down to Helena, all the way down to Taos, all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico, all the way down into Mexico. And this road existed. And the Blackfoot knew it as the Old North Trail. And this is how we knew our lands. Because every river that flows eastward, our people traveled. And we knew where it uh, ended, the Gulf of Mexico or the Hudson's Bay. So our people knew our lands very well. And this wasn't in the days when we got the horse. This is in the dog days. Our people had to walk all over these lands. So we got to know our lands intimately. So let's move on to the next image. And so here we have some people looking out over the hills at the, at the buffalo or yi ni. So the Siksikaiti to be, the Blackfoot speaking people, we were pedestrian people. And we only traveled short distances at that time. Because really you're only as fast as the slowest member of your, of your group. And if those uh, include children, elderly, or infirm, then you could only travel so fast even when you're walking. So in those days, we probably only cover three to five miles at a time from breaking camp and setting up new camp. But as long as Iniksi, 
are the buffalo herds. We're within sight. The Matapiks were content. We were happy. The people were happy because, and that's what Matapiks means in Blackfoot. It means people, the people. So as long as the people saw the herds, we were happy because we knew that we have our uh, food, our clothing, our shelter right nearby. And this basically started in the dog days, as I mentioned. And the one thing I kind of want to mention about the dog days, as Blackfoot people, we pretty much lived, our entire existence was in the dog days. It wasn't until the 17th century with the introduction of the horse that that lifestyle changed. So that wasn't so long ago. And a lot of our traditions and a lot of our ceremonies are still based on when the buffalo used to run all over this land. So let's move on to the next image. Now here is Kitawa Sanun. So I'm going to try these words. I need to talk to an elder to know if I'm saying them properly. But our territory extended from Ponukasi Seta, or the North Saskatchewan River, south to Otako Tahtai or the Yellowstone River. And if there's any people out there who want to correct me, please feel free to correct me. You can send in your comments and such to the Facebook page, or you can contact me at programs at blackfootcrossing.com. Well, our people, we lived within these two rivers, the North Saskatchewan River in the north and the Yellowstone River in the south. And then from the backbone of the world, our Mistakists, this is how the Blackfoot knew the Rocky Mountains, as the backbone of the earth. So from the backbone of the earth eastwards to the Kapow Valley, Touchwood Hills, almost to the Manitoba Escarpment. This, as you see in the map, was all Kitawasan, our land, our homeland, because this is where the buffalo roamed. And you know, a lot of people don't know this, but bison, they don't migrate south when it gets warm. When it gets cold, they go to the sheltered river valleys or the foothills to ride out the winter. And then when it warms up, they go back onto the plains to eat. Now, if you look at it, it's like one big circle, one big cycle. Every year, they leave the mountains early in the spring. They go out onto the plains to eat all the grass. And then they make their way back to the foothills by uh, the fall time. And then by the time winter comes, they're already settled in the sheltered river valleys and foothills. And in anticipation of that, our people would have already set up our winter camps and our kill sites in anticipation of their return. So this cycle existed literally for thousands of years and our people were doing this for thousands of years up until the 17th century, 300 or so years ago when the horse came. Then our life changed on a, on a grand scale. And we'll talk more about that later. But let's move on to the next image. So here we have a picture of the continent and this is the Great Plains and the Buffalo Range as I was speaking. So from pre-contact to present day. Now that light brown area that you see, before there were any people, uh, well basically I should say settlers, European settlers, before they settled this continent and came over here, they figured that that was the plains and that was the extent of the bison herd. So they covered most of the plains in North America. And at that time they figured there could have been 60 to 50 million bison roaming the plains. So this was their land. Then over time, um, with hunting and then with settlement and such, you could see how those, those uh, herds, they kind of start to dwindle. Because then you see the darker brown. And that darker brown was around the time of uh, the 17th century up until um, the 20th century. And then you could see all those little dark herds, the little black dots on that map. And that's what left of the buffalo, the great buffalo herds from those days. So we were talking about maybe thousands as opposed to tens of millions. So this is kind of a story of what happened to the buffalo. Now let's go on to the next image. So you see the buffalo range there, and you can see that same map on the right hand side there. But on the left hand side you can see a lot of those tribes here in North America that hunted the bison. And you can see up top there the Blackfoot, and then you have the, they have Sarsi, and just below them at Sina. Well, all of that land there, those were allies, but the majority of that land was filled by Blackfoot. And it wasn't until years later that other tribes, such as the Plains Cree and the Sinoboyan tribes, actually came onto what we considered our land. 
and then they started becoming plains uh, natives themselves and started to hunt the buffalo over time. But originally, the tribes that you see in that white area there, the, these were all buffalo hunting tribes. And you can kind of see how they're positioned in North America as opposed to the Great Plains. So the Blackfoot from the Yellowstone North, that's what we considered our, our homeland, our hunting grounds. So let's move on to the next image. Now, even in the dog days when our people are on foot, we moved camp. And by moving camp frequently, we were able to avoid depleting all the resources in that one area. And like I said, that was a big part of our way of life. You use what you need and then you'd move on. And so our ecological footprint was very minimal. We'd only stay in a certain place for a certain period of time to do what we needed to do. And then we'd move on to another place where we might have to uh, collect other plants, let's say. Um, so by moving camp, we were able to avoid depleting those resources. So in those days, our mothers and our fathers, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, their lives were nomadic and pedestrian. And I guess those are big words just to basically say we walked all over. But you know, um, that's kind of not true because it sounds like roaming has that connotation of just wandering about with no purpose. But that wasn't the case with the Blackfoot. Because if you look at that one map there, you kind of see it uh, enlarged from the smaller area there. And this is part of uh, within the Blackfoot lands. Now those little green marks you can see on there, that's actually one tribe's travels in a year. So they kind of left one area, they made their way out into the plains and did any number of places, stops about, I think it was about 13 or 14 stops, places they set up camp over the year and then made their way back to almost where they left. And so this is how our people used to travel. Each uh, clan or each tribe would have a certain area that they lived in and they would hunt. That tribe would hunt maybe one particular area and then maybe across the river that would be their, uh, another part of the tribe, another clan that was hunting on that side. And so over the course of a year, they would never stay in one area long enough to ruin it. And in this particular map, you could see them leaving the mountains, but somewhere in the middle of their travels, they realized they needed a lodgepole pine. And you can only get that in the Rocky Mountains or in the Cypress Hills. And that's what we used those lodgepole pine for our teepees in the horse days. Or you'd have to go birch. And Cypress Hills is known for birch trees as well. So our people used the birch poles for the travois. And if we needed new poles, well, we would go either to the Rocky Mountains or we would go all the way to Cypress Hills. And you can see that this particular tribe in its year's travel kind of did that. They made their way over a certain area and then kind of back. So our people used to know our areas very well, intimately, like I said, because we would stay in one area and we would walk it. And so by the time uh, the horse came, we knew our areas already very, very well, but we could only travel faster now that the horse came. But we'll talk about that in a bit. Let's move on to the next image. Okay, what we have here is a dog travois. So you can kind of see that there. There's two poles, birch poles, and they would have been lashed onto the back of a dog on a harness of sorts, and they would have been uh, strapped down. And then at the back of that travois is a basket, or as you can see there are some poles, something to carry. And you could put 80 to 100 pounds on the back of that, and that dog would be able to take that load from point A to point B. But you'd have to be careful, you'd have to have them on a leash. And if you had five or six dogs, you'd have to have all of your dogs maybe muzzled and leashed as you're making your way to point B. And you just hope that a rabbit or some small animal doesn't just jump out and start running and then your dogs are chasing after with all your gear, because there's stories of that actually happening as well. But that was a dog travel, and that's, it's in the Blackfoot belief that it was our mothers and our grandmothers who kind of invented these contraptions because they were more of the domestic handlers of all the situations. So they would have had to break camp and set up camp and they would have had to figure out how to do that quickly and easily. So it is a Blackfoot belief that it was our mothers and grandmothers who invented these things. So even as far back as a dog day, they realized that they could put poles on the side of it and that that animal as our beast of burden could carry our goods across uh, the Great Plains, as I mentioned. And here you can see a picture of some of these dogs being lashed up and uh, the dog travel I'll put on them. And as I mentioned, you'd start walking with them. 
going to your next destination. Maybe that place has a lot of berries that you need to collect for your uh, your winter supply of dried meat and uh, uh, pemmican. Or perhaps you need to go to uh, a place to get your poles. Or perhaps you need to go to a place to collect uh, medicines or camas root or any number of different things. Now here's a dog travois just to kind of look at it and for the most part the dogs would carry the home. So nitois, our homes are all collapsed, the poles are on the back of the dog and then the, the buffalo cover, the buffalo hide was actually folded up and put on the back of that and that dog was able to carry that load from point A to point B. And then you'd have your other dogs and maybe they would be kind of taking some other things, personal belongings, etc. And these things you would take from point A to point B. Now the thing is in the dog days you really couldn't accumulate a lot of wealth. And that's the truth because you're on foot and how much can you truly carry, can a person carry and, and what are you prepared to carry from one place to another. So in the dog days we weren't really caring about wealth. It was more, even amongst our people, it, is, it was, they were equals. I think it's called egalitarian, but that's kind of like how our people were in the dog days. Everybody, we shared everything with everybody. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Now in the dog days, well actually let's move on to the next image. I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh here we go, now here's part of the Blackfoot country. We see a young man with his family moving from one place to another, a clan or the tribe or the, the scout. But then you see the dogs there carrying the travois. And as they're moving, these dogs are faithfully standing beside their owners and they're moving with them from point A to point B. And you know, there's one thing I kind of want to say about our dogs as Blackfoot people. Like I mentioned earlier, they're sacred. And the thing is, there's a lot of other tribes out there who would eat dogs, either as a delicacy or as part of their ceremony. But to the Blackfoot, eating a dog was um, like cannibalism. You're eating your friend. In fact, because to the Blackfoot people, dogs are our friends. Old stories say that all the animals abandoned us because they couldn't trust us as human beings, but the only animal that didn't abandon us was the dog, and he stood by our side. And that's so, that's so uh, true. The dog is a faithful, loyal companion to dogs, and in fact to the Blackfoot, this animal, uh, we believe, protected us. Not just uh, physically, but spiritually. There was bad uh, spirits or such around that they can sense them and they can bark and chase them away, and things like that. And also with the dog, our people uh, would bring these animals into their teepees sometimes, into the nitois to stay, for them to stay warm in really bitter temperatures and such. So our dogs were very special to us. They helped us hunt, to flush game, even in warfare. So we trained our dogs and our dogs were very, very uh, uh, special to the Blackfoot people. Um, there's stories of people in the dog days owning as much as 50, 60 dogs and they would breed them and they would give them to uh, other people as gifts just as they did with the horses. So let's move on to the next image. Now here's uh, Dog Day's teepee. They were very big. Now and in those days, in the dog days, we didn't use pegs to, to keep the hide down. We used stones. So hence all the teepee rings that you see in southern, and southern Alberta and Saskatchewan and Montana well, these are all evidence of our people moving from one place to another, these teepee rings, because they all, some of them range in diameter from maybe uh, uh, five meters, from, or actually from like three meters to like uh, five meters, the diameter of these tents. So they weren't very big. You're probably looking at maybe uh, 10 foot, 12 foot poles last to the top, and you'd have like a seven foot clearance inside your tent, and maybe you could comfortably see, sleep five or six people in a dog day's nitois, in a tent. It wasn't until the horse came that our, that our tents, our nitois, became bigger. And now you're looking at about uh, a 20, 20 foot diameter, 25, 30 foot and up, and poles from 15 feet, 16 feet, all the way up to um, 30, 40 foot poles to put up uh, the nitois, our homes. So, but in the dog days, like I mentioned, our homes weren't very big. They were kind of small and they would be able to be just sufficient enough for a small family. When the horses got bigger, they act, I mean not the horses, when the teepees got bigger, when the horse was introduced, well then you could probably sleep anywhere from 8 to 12 people inside of uh, nitois. Well, let's move on to the next image. 
Now here's how our Nidoyis were kind of set up, or what you would call, I guess, the Blackfoot teepee. I just wanted to point up there, you can see a tie, there's two types of ties. Well, most of the tribes in North America use three poles or a tripod when they're setting up their teepees. But the Blackfoot, we've always used four. And in fact, there's only three or four tribes in all of North America that use four poles as a base for their mainframe. And that's the Blackfoot tribes, or the Siksikaitsi, the Beaks. Our allies, the Tutena, are, some people call them the Sarsi, they prefer to be called the Tutena. And then you have tribes uh, like the Crow, who were friends of ours, and the Kiowa, who were friends of ours in the past at one time, and then they made their way south and carried that same sort of technology, the four poles. But to the Blackfoot people, four is a sacred number. So our homes had four poles. And the way we set up our nitois is different than all these other tribes that use a tripod. And in a sense, we believe uh, these other tribes who weren't originally buffalo people, didn't really originally hunt the bison, they planted corn, squash, beans on the Mississippi and in regions east of there. A lot of them were displaced. And when the settlers came in from Europe and moved them out of their homelands, they had to come onto the plains and learn to live on the plains. And a lot of them had to learn by studying the tribes that already existed, that were already hunting bison. And the Blackfoot, we're one of those original tribes that were bison hunters. Even going back into our stories and antiquity and ancient uh, legends and tales, our stories say we've always been here since after the flood. So whether that's biblical or ice age, our people have always been in Kitoasin, what we considered our homeland. We were here first. So let's move on to the next image. Now here we have a picture of bison in the winter. And like I mentioned, the bison, they don't go south. They don't migrate south when the weather gets bad. They go into the sheltered river valleys or the foothills. And then in anticipation of their arrival, our people would have already set up our camps near kill sites and we'll talk about that as we're going along so actually let's go on to the next image now here's the dog days and in the dog days the biggest event are events of the year were the communal hunts now in those communal hunts everybody in the tribe was a part of it there was nobody who was not a part of it in fact everybody knew their role and we knew our roles because of what we were taught in ceremony taught uh, by our elders, by our people who are actually doing the hunting or engaged in it, involved in it. And a lot of that is tied up in ceremony to this day. And even though there are no longer millions of buffalo, if there were, our people would still know how to hunt this animal. And I'll explain some of this to you uh, basic, ba in a basic way. Now, these animals, Imi, as I mentioned, this was our staff of life. And this was a beautiful, majestic animal. It truly is. And our people had a special relationship with it. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the animal that volunteered. When the Creator had all the animals together, according to our stories, He asked, who's going to help this pathetic creature? And He was referring to us as men, mankind. Who's going to help this pathetic creature? Because according to the stories, we're pathetic. We don't even have claws to defend ourselves or to attack. And we, have, we don't have fangs. And we don't have... Uh, uh, claws and paws and to defend ourselves, etc. And we're naked. We have no fur, or very little of it. So the creator asked which of the animals would help us. Well, the story is the mouse came up first. So the mouse was the one who actually uh, volunteered first, but the creator says, oh, thank you very much. You got, we'll give you other duties, but uh, um, we have to go. Who else? We need somebody bigger. And that's when Ini, Ini came up, and Ini said, I'll help them. And then ever since, we've had that sacred relationship. The story is much longer than that, but I'm just kind of uh, touching on some of the key po points of it. Now, so the Blackwood people, we've always had a special relationship with e Ni. Let's move on to the next image. Now, before, during the communal hunt, as I mentioned, everybody was involved. But before you can actually have the hunt, you had to prepare the kill site. Now, um, there's a lot of stories to this, but in the old days, these rock piles were put where women actually stood it before these rock piles were there. A woman would have stood there with her travois and she would have kind of been um, part of this, what they call a drive lane. Now the drive lane could be 
uh, maybe a few hundred meters, or it could extend as far as two miles from one point to the other. Now the one point was always near the edge of a kill site, where the trap was, where the actual trap was, where the animals would enter and not get out. At that point, all the way out, about a mile or two, they would have these rock piles, maybe spaced out about 20 feet. And if you ever go to places like Head Smashed and Buffalo Jump, you can see these rock piles, and we'll talk about them. But ours, uh, we'll go, we'll talk a little bit more as we go along, because we, I think we do have images. But it was our women and our, and who would set up these rock piles. Now, at one time, as I mentioned, there would would have been a woman who stood in that area, and then they would have had a successful kill, maybe a lot of emi or buffalo running over the cliff there. And then what they would do is they would put a rock in that area where that mother or grandmother stood. And then over the years, as they returned to that kill site over and over, they would put rocks at that on top of that original rock, and then you'd have a rock pile. Because to the Blackfoot people, we call these rock piles that you see there, um, in the one picture extending off in the distance, we call these rock piles a geeks, meaning the women. And that's the reason why we call them the women, is because originally at this kill site, that wouldn't, there would have been no rocks there. There would have been our mothers and grandmothers standing in a line, extending about a mile this way, and then mothers and grandmothers standing in a line, extending maybe two miles the other direction. But that's where they would be with some of their children. And should the buffalo try and cross that line that they've made, they would simply make noise or, or move the buffalo rope to startle the buffalo into not wanting to go that way. Then they would continue running towards the trap. So that's a lot of preparation at first before then because our um, the kids and our mothers and grandmothers and these ones, they would be setting up these rock piles and making sure that they're, uh, they're usable. Now, if you can see the other direction there, that's basically what we call in Blackwood a piskan, or a, um, a deep blood kettle, it translates to somewhat, but it's also a buffalo trap. And now these buffalo traps were different. Some of them were like head smash and buffalo jump at Hammer Hill or Buxoxus, where you could drive the animals off of the cliff and they would literally fall to their deaths. And this was just one way of piskan. If we look at the next image, actually, we can see a different types. Now here's the herds. Now, when we were hunting, we'll talk a little bit how our hunting technique, what we learned as Blackfoot people, and that's why I believe our Blackfoot people knew how to hunt this animal, because we did it for thousands of years. Now these herds would have existed all around us on our lands. So there was no shortage of Eni. There was literally, like I mentioned, millions and millions of Eni, buffalo all over the plains. What the Blackfoot had to do was isolate a herd that they could drive into one of these traps. And so we had an elaborate method of doing this. To the Blackfoot, we would get our youth. And I want to point out, to the Blackfoot, we had no gender roles. So it didn't matter. If you were a fast runner, a boy or a girl, they would put on that wolf disguise and then they would act as wolves. Because to the Blackfoot people, our ancient stories tell us that it was the wolf or the wolf people who actually taught us how to hunt Eni. And so we learned from this animal and then we developed our hunting habits kind of the same way as the wolf. So what we would do is we would pretend we were wolves and we'd wear these disguises and we'd be scattered out. So maybe that particular tribe would have 60 youth. Maybe they would have 30 youth, let's say 30 youth. They would send out all those runners, all those youth, boys and girls with these wolf disguises on. And what they would do is they would scout out a herd. They would kind of single it out these runners, and they would be spread out. And the thing is, because uh, the buffalo or bison aren't afraid of one wolf, the wolf can get close, because the bison expect them to be curious. But they, you wouldn't get too close, because then you could get stomped to death or gored to death by one of these huge, huge animals. So our scouts or our kids, they would go so close just to, to observe them and to move them, but they wouldn't go close enough to get stomped on or killed. But we would have all these youths spread out, singling out at one herd from all the thousands of herds out there. And then what they would do as they were running around them, they would kind of bring them or drive them to a gathering area. Now here you see a youth there with a wolf skin on. And when they weren't just sent out there, now our youth would have been trained. They would have known exactly what their role is, what to do, what the dangers were, etc. because it was all part of our learning as a, as a community. So 
they would, like I mentioned there, here you see a wolf suit and here you have a kid with a wolf outfit. Well, these kids were important. They were part of the community. They were the ones that gathered up the animals, gathered up the buffalo so that we could um, drive them into a drive lane and into a buffalo trap. But there were other actors that were a part of this. Now, one of them was the calf rope decoy. Now, once again, that could be a boy or a girl. That was a gen there were no gender roles. So this, these people, there could have been more than one. Maybe you could have had three of them. But what these people did, these kids, is they dressed in that calf robe decoy, that skin. And what they would do is they would pretend that they were calves. And then what they would do before they actually entered the herd of buffalo is actually, let's go back to the next image. That's the next part. Uh, what they would actually do is they would take uh, sweet grass or they would take sweet pine or any number of these different types of uh, scented herbs and they would rub them all over their bodies to get rid of that human stink or the humanity or smell because if the buffalo smells a human they're gone they're not even going to stick around so you had to cover up that scent and so that's how they would do it is with these uh, herbs and with this grass and then once they got their scent covered, then they would put on this uh, buffalo robe, this calf robe. And then what they did, their job was to infiltrate the herd. So they, they would actually run with the herd that's been, that's kind of been cordoned off by, by all the other youth. So they would actually jump in with that herd and pretend they're calves. Now if anybody sees buffalo calves, they frolic, they jump around, they move around, they have fun, and that's what these calves do. Now the thing is, the, the herds of buffalo, they're not led by the bulls. Who knows where the bulls are? They could be all off somewhere doing whatever. The herds were led by the older cows. And so these cows had a strong maternal instinct. Now what these calf rope decoy people would do, as I said, they would infiltrate the crowd. Now if the buffalo was walking northward, but the trap was eastward, that he, they needed the herd to go east towards where the, the Piscan is, where the entrance to either falling to the deaths or going into a big coulee or something that they couldn't get out is in the eastern direction. So what these calf robe decoys would do is they would run with that herd going north, running north, and then they would jump out of the herd and they would start making their way eastward towards the trap. And guess what the herds do? Because they're led by the older cows who have a strong maternal instinct, they actually turn and they follow those calf rope decoys towards the trap. And that's what you see in this image, is you see there's a calf rope decoy who's made his way to the lip of the trap, but now he's hiding behind the rocks because he's managed to get the, the ini or the bison to follow him. Now if we look at the next image, this is the result. You can see that there's people all around the kill site, but at the top there, in the one image on the right, that's the boy who led his led the Ini to that particular kill site there. And so what he's doing is he's hiding, but the, the buffalo or the Ini, they had no idea where he went. As far as they were concerned, they saw him running in that direction and they were following him. So maybe he went down a hill they can't see, they're still going to follow him. And then because they can't see the precipice, these animals either fall to their death or they run into a biscuit or a buffalo trap that they can't get out of. And we'll see some images of that. So this is, in a nutshell, kind of how the Blackfoot would hunt the buffalo. And of course, we'd have those people who would be praying and making those holy prayers and asking for help because we knew this was our staff of life. We needed this food. We needed this animal because this was our survival, even over the cold winter months, which lasted about six months up in Blackfoot country. Now let's move on to the next image. Now here you have the image of people who are dressed in a full buffalo robe outfit. They were kind of like hidden behind those rocks as well and when they see the calf robe boy running towards the trap they would run after him behind him and fooling the nearsighted buffalo into thinking that there's other ini running in that direction so maybe they think it's safe to run in that direction so they would run in that direction as well and ultimately come to their deaths, their demise. So yeah, and that job there too. You know, our people had to be in good shape those days. When you really think about it, there's a lot of stories of people running 20 miles, even our youth, and it was no big deal that they could run these long distances. And I believe it. And even then, the most, um, uh, how would you say, respected person in the tribe probably was your fastest runner. The person who could run the fastest. 
And so, you know, our people, youth out there, you should remember that, that you have a good reason uh, to want to keep yourselves healthy because our ancestors, their way of life kept them healthy. So here you see the two different types of biscuit that the Blackfoot had. Now, one is like a uh, head smashed in buffalo jump. You drove the animals off a precipice or a cut bank. We even drove the animals off of cut banks into the river. And then uh, it's easier to move the carcasses when they're dead because you could float it across the river to where you need it. But yeah, we would drive the animals off of precipices. Cut banks, cliffs, head smashed in buffalo jump is a good example of one of these places. But on the right, you see another image there, and that's like a fence or a corral around uh, buffalo. And this in Blackwood is what we call the piscan. And as a Siksika, uh, meaning um, Blackfoot people, my tribe, where I'm from, our people in the Blackfoot language, we were called Sokita Peaks. And that means plains people, our prairie people. Because the Blackfoot people, the Siksika tribe, we lived on the plains, not in the foothills, not in the mountains, but on the plains, kind of near uh, Nut Mountain, up near uh, Prince Albert in those areas. We lived in those areas with our Arapaho allies. Arapaho and Groven are the same people. But that's the area that we lived in. And when we lived in those areas, we used the kind of trap you would see on the right there. Uh, basically a biscuit, which was um, a trap. Either a coolie they run into or a corral that they can get off, get out of. And then our people would kill them at their leisure, whoever's trapped in there. And these were our ways of securing our meat supply and our food or clothing for the winter months. Now let's look at the next image. Here we have uh, different types of uh, biscuits, as I mentioned, the, what they called a pound. This is, these are all for examples of pounds. The, the buffalo or ini would be driven into a trap and they would go into an area they couldn't escape, either because there was like a temporary fence or it was a natural coulee that was so steep that once they ran into that area, they couldn't run back out. And like I said, once you could get those animals into this pound, then you can kill them at your leisure. If you had a hundred animals in there, then you had all of these animals trapped and you could uh, butcher them, kill them and butcher them and, uh, and use them. So these are, as I mentioned, also biscuit. This is uh, what the Blackfoot considered our, our way of hunting since the buffalo days. And literally for thousands and thousands of years, this was how the Blackfoot hunted ini, or the bison. So let's move to the next image. Here we had, and of course, you know where those women are, and I mentioned behind those rocks when they were standing there at first. Um, these are those people who would have helped them as well. Because once they got the herds, in the gathering area, and then they started to stampede them, and then the calf rope decoys did their job. As they started doing that, the buffalo would be in between these drive lanes, and that's when all the participants, everybody in the communal hunt, would all jump up and they would all yell on signal from the leader of the pack or the chief, and then they would stampede all of those animals into a run. And they would run as fast as they can, not knowing where they're going until maybe last minute. And then they would go into the trap or they would go off the cliff to their deaths. But as I mentioned, in the Ido Dasi Mapimi days, in the dog days, everybody in the tribe took part in it. And everybody benefited. And you know, we won't get into it too much today, but even the way we butchered, was different than any of the other tribes in North America. The Blackfoot cut up ini a certain way, and it was all based on distribution, what we considered fair. And there's no other tribes to my knowledge who do it that way. So that's why these sort of practices make me feel, truly feel that our people were ancient people, ancient buffalo hunters, and we were one of the first ones here on this continent. So let's move into the next image. Here you kind of see those uh, people behind the drive lanes there, they're ready to make a uh, noise to startle the buffalo into running in a certain direction. And here you kind of see them also uh, up near the cliffs. Now we'll talk about this in a bit here, but there's a lot of uh, buffalo jumps and they're the more famous ones. And that's because that's what the Blackfoot did. They drove these animals off of these precipices. So today, that's what a lot of people think a buffalo jump is, and that we always went to one particular buffalo jump. Well, we did, but what people don't understand is that there's buffalo jumps or biscuit all over our land, everywhere. Deep coolies, any place. And our people in those days would have used anything they could 
to catch those animals. So in the old days, the original buffalo hunts, they didn't take day, uh, weeks, months even. They didn't even take days. You practically only had hours to deliver, to do your hunt and hope you're successful. So our people back then, everybody knew their role. So when the chief said, hey, there's buffalo there, let's go get them, everybody knew what it was that they had to do. There, there wasn't people who had to be told. We knew our roles. So let's move on to the next image. Okay, so I kind of wanted to mention, here you got a, a Blackfoot and Adel Adel. Kind of looks familiar, I can't place him. I think he's from Gaina. But anyways, this is an Adel Adel. That's uh, actually the word in Spanish that they come up with that the Aztecs were still using. Now even in the 1500s, the Aztec tribes didn't have the bow and arrow. They had what they call Adel Adels, and that's what you see there. Now those are throwing spears. Now these throwing spears, in the days, they talk archaeological of our people at one time using long spears, clovis points, fulsome points to hunt animals here on this continent. But at all these kill sites, you don't find those kind of weaponry. What you find are adaladal points. So you find these adaladal points at places like Head Smash and Buffalo Jump, at Old Woman's Buffalo Jump, at Madison Buffalo Jump, Ohm, all these different areas all spread out throughout our territory all contain adaladal points from before we got the bow and arrow. So even at Old Woman's Buffalo Jump, they talk about the men and the women meeting for the first time and creating our Blackfoot people as we know it at that area there. And there are no uh, other types of arrowheads, or points I should say, other than Adel Adel and then the bow and arrow. And all of this weaponry has all been proven to belong to our people, Siksikaitsi to be, not to other tribes. Some of their weaponry may have been here, some of their points, but they were here as visitors. This wasn't their homeland. Most of these sites are covered with Blackwood arrow points, what we knew were our weaponry before our contact with the settlers. So the Adelado points, that's what an Adelado is, and these were the different kill sites, and these were the different type of weapons that our people used when we hunted the buffalo. So either we speared the animal in, uh, in deep snow or in marshes or any of the wetlands that we had, we drove them into the bisguns, uh, either off cliffs or into pounds that they couldn't get out of. But as long as we know our history as Blackfoot speaking peoples, we've always been hunting Eni since the beginning of our existence. So let's move on to the next image. And here we have uh, a man with the bow and arrow. As I mentioned, the bow and arrow replaced the Adel Adel, and the Blackfoot had this technology. It's kind of, um, you know, it's wondering to wonder where the technology came from because a lot of tribes in the eastern parts of the continent did not have this technology, but the Blackfoot did. And a lot of tribes that are west towards the mountains had the bow and arrow. And they believe this may have came from the northern parts, up around the um, Alaska maybe, or places like that is how the bow and arrow came into North America from the old world, they call it, from uh, Asia. So yes, once the, the arrow came, now we had a new weapon to hunt the Eni with, but our method of hunting never changed, even with the technology. And that's interesting to say, because even when we did receive the rifle, the musket first and then repeating rifles, we still hunted buffalo, Eni, pretty much the same way. We herded them and we drove them into kill sites, just like you see here. We drive them off the precipices, or we drive them into uh, coolies. So these are just some images of uh, how uh, one type of this gun would look. If we look at the next image, Oh yes, now after the hunt. Now that's when the butchering began. So the men would dispatch all the living animals at the base of the cliff or the kill site or inside the kill site if it was a deep coulee. And then it came to, like I said, dispatching the animals, finishing them, and then the work would start. So the Blackfoot tribes in those days, they wouldn't have camped like maybe a day's ride or even a few miles away from the kill site. Our camps would have been somewhat near the, near the kill site and hopefully uh, upwind from it because there would be so much uh, carcasses and such over days that the smell would get pretty heavy. So our people would have to butcher this animal as quick as they can. So our, 
like I mentioned, our way of butchering the buffalo was different, completely different compared to any other Plains tribe. We had our own way of butchering, and like I said, it was all based on equality. Everybody was given the same portion. No one could ever complain and say they didn't get this or get that. Everybody got that, and then some. And so that's what they would do at these kill sites. So we look at the next image. Here you have the, um, our, the women butchering the buffalo. And the thing is, our women, when it came to eating the buffalo, uh, well, you know, of course, after a buffalo hunt, the entire tribe would eat fresh meat for days. You'd have fresh meat. You can gorge on it. You'd have roasted meat, boiled meat. But eventually, all of that meat would start to rot. And there's no possible way that even the tribe could eat all of those ini, those killed bison, um, in one setting. So what our mothers and grandmothers learned to do is to cut the animal into long thin strips and they would take these long thin strips and they would put them on drying racks sort of like depicted in the right there and what they would do is they would leave that meat up there for days in the sun in the wind and there'd be a little fire underneath so that uh, the bugs wouldn't bug it so much it would drive away the insects but then this meat would dry and our mothers and grandmothers wanted that meat to be uh, well, after two days or so, you'd have meat the consistency of uh, beef jerky or gai. So that's edible, and you could save that. But we wanted, our mothers wanted it drier than that. So they'd work maybe four days, five days in the sun, to the point where this dried meat could be broken, could be uh, broken into pieces, like uh, it's so brittle, even into powder. And what they would do is all the berries that the family collected all year long, they would bring to their mortar and pestle and they would break all these berries, including the pits, into a mash. And once they got that berry mash, they would mix their berry mash and that dried meat and they would mix it together and put it in parfleche bags. And they came up with what people today know as pemmican, which is dried meat. Um, it's a mixture between dry, um, ground up dried meat and berries. Now our people have another name for this. We actually quite have quite a few names. I'm not even sure which one it would be. Mokamani, or I'm not even saying if I'm sure saying that right. But our mothers and grandmothers invented this. And this parflesh bag full of pemmican was about 50 pounds. And this went back into the dog days. Now our people used to have these 50 pound parfleshes in the dog days. And you could put one of them on the back of a, of a trab walk when you're traveling from one place to another. So these dogs would be carrying not only our homes on their backs, but our food supply. And our people have been butchering this animal like this since time immemorial. It's just a part of our way when we hunted this animal, how we would cut it up. Now. Aside from the pemmican, we also had a whole lot of other uses. Now, we, like I said, we could eat this animal roasted, or we could eat it boiled, or we could eat it uh, preserved as pemmican in parfleche bags. But also, our people, actually, let's go to the next image. You got our hides. Now, now the hides were used for our homes and for some of our bedding, for our clothing, winter clothing particularly, hats and gloves and such and things like that. And there you can see all that dried meat from the buffalo that's all being dried in the sun. And that meat is going to turn into pemmican, as they know it. And this is what's going to preserve our people in the winter months. Because if anybody's lived in the Calgary region or in Blackwood country, the seasons actually break down like this. Six months of cold weather, six months of warm weather. And that's because of this ancient battle between old man winter and thunder. Sistigum, or the uh, cold maker. But you know, these are part of our stories, our legends. Now here we have our women not just uh, tanning the hides, but they're actually breaking them down. And so there was a lot of work involved with the making our homes and our clothing and our implements, but our people knew how to do it, especially when we had uh, ini here. So let's actually go on to the next image. Now here's the buffalo, and this is just some of the reasons, ini, what we used them for. Well, we used them for our moccasins, for clothing, for cradles, for winter robes, our shirts, our leggings. Oh, the list goes on and on. Pipe bags, quivers, teepee covers, doi covers, I should say, gun covers. We'd use the muscles. Um, when we butchered the animal, we'd use its sinew. And this is what we used to bind our garments and such together, was sinew. And we'd also make, uh, like I mentioned, beef jerky or dried meat. So even the animal's tail we'd use as a brush, a fly, like a whip. You could put the t 
tail in water and splash your rocks inside a sweat lodge. Uh, we had a purpose for everything. Even uh, soap, cooking oil came from this animal. It's bones, we make knives, arrowheads, shovels, all sorts of things out of this one particular animal. So this was how important, that's why I say to the Blackwood speaking peoples, Ini was our staff of life. Because he didn't just provide us our food or clothing, but he also provided, also had uh, hundreds of other uses. So let's move on to the next picture. Um, so here's some women butchering. We'll kind of go through this so, um, kind of a little quickly here. Let's look at the next image. Now here's Madison Buffalo Jump, and this is within the Blackwood Territories. This is near the Three Forks of the Missouri, but here you can see a picture. This is like head smashed in. Our people would have went up top and had to do all the elaborate planning and, and decoying and such, and then they would drive the animals over the cliffs to their deaths, and then there again it ensured our survival. So this is in Madison. This is actually in uh, the Three Forks of the Missouri, and here's the Ompis gun. That's also a buffalo jump. And that's kind of near, uh, I believe that's kind of southern Montana. I'm not too exactly which city is closest to it. But this also was a, was a this gun that uh, Blackfoot would use. And like I mentioned, our weaponry is there. So we know that our people are, have been in all of these places. And we've been hunting Ini in these places for literally thousands of years. So let's move to the next image. This one's a head smashed in Buffalo Jump. Of course, this is the most famous. Everybody knows of this place. And this is located in the Porcupine Hills. And our people used to drive the animals off of this biscuit. And the interesting thing about that is the archaeological evidence, of course. There was a period of time where it wasn't used at all. For like a thousand years, that's a mystery. And we wonder, well, why was that the case? Some people say it was the Alta Thermal time. Maybe it was like a desert out here, so there were no buffalo. It's hard to say. I'd still like to find that out. But for the most part, and you know what's funny? Even the Blackfoot stories reflect a time when we were hunting buffalo, and then they disappeared. And one of our stories says they had to go through this adventure and get the buffalo released, and then finally there was a buffalo again. So... You know, these kind of stories may seem short in general to general public, for, but those people who know our traditional ways, they go deeper than that. You realize that, you know, there are some ties here. There is something to uh, the, the scientific world. Maybe that's what it was, the ultra thermal. But uh, this is the head smashed in buffalo jump, and let's move on to the old woman's buffalo jump. And like I mentioned, in all these different uh, kill sites, our people's, there's evidence of the Siksikaiti to be being here for thousands of years. And this old woman's buffalo jump, we call it old woman's because according to the ancient stories, this is where our men folk met up with the women folk. And they had their own language and they had their own ways and they were doing their own things. And then we agreed, according to the story, to live together. And you know, the weird thing about that is even to this day, our Blackfoot women, Blackfoot speakers, they have words that only they use. And then there's words that only the men would use. So I kind of believe that story. But this is where it all happened at the old woman's buffalo jump. And this place was discovered maybe back in, the, I think it was 1960s by Richard Forbes. And they did a study there. A flood had gone through and then the flood had washed the bottom of this creek bed and then exposed all of this bone beds that literally went about, I believe it was 27 feet or nine meters in the one place that they excavated. And they found nothing but bones and addle addle arrowheads and, uh, and, arrow, and regular arrowheads. So, yeah, this is the old woman's buffalo jump. Here's some of those points I was talking about that they found on, at these places. And both these styles, some people say one style was used by the Blackfoot and other tribes. That's all baloney. Because as Blackfoot people, we would have known our neighbors and we would have even traded with them. So a lot of this stuff here, these points that they find at these kill sites, whether they say plain side notched or plains corner notched, this was Blackfoot weaponry. And there was no indication of other tribes. This was all, like I said, Blackfoot territory, and this was the weaponry that we use because it's evident in all of these different kill sites. So if anybody wants to study that on your own, please feel free and then write back to us and, and show us your findings. So let's move on to the next part. So here we have uh, kind of that transition now. Now from the dog days, like I mentioned, that was basically untold thousands of years, millennia even, that the Blackfoot people were living in the dog days. And that ended when the horse came, Punukomita. And we received the horse around 1700. And even to the Blackfoot people to this day, they believe that Punukomita, like the dog, was a gift to us from the underwater people. So eat the beaks. 
and that this animal came out of the water and we started to use this animal the same way we used the dog. As you can see there, we, now we have a travois for a horse, but we needed longer poles and hence the lodgepole pine. That's why we use lodgepole pine to this day to set up our nidois, our, our lodges. And those poles, like I said, they made our homes. Originally when they were on dogs, they made our tents, which were smaller. But these poles that are on the back of the horses are much, much longer. Now, like I mentioned, anywhere from 16 feet to 40 feet. And they would be on the back of these horses. And then they, we'd leave point A, break camp. And when we got to point B, we'd set up camp. And it was our mothers and our grandmothers who owned the, owned the dois. And so they were the ones who were in charge of its maintenance and its keeping. And so they were the ones who put up our homes. And like I mentioned, once the horse came, our homes became much, much larger. Now you're not looking at a, maybe a 12 foot diameter. Now you've got like 20, 25, 30 feet diameter and you can sleep 12 people comfortably in some of these new nidoyes. But here you can kind of see that. You see the dog travel at the bottom there made out of birch poles that the dog pulled. And then you see the lodge pole pine on the horse. And this is what the Blackfoot used to set up our homes, nidoyes. So if we go to the next image, we can see that change. Because once we got this animal, our hunting methods changed. But we still used this guns, even up until the, uh, when the buffalo disappeared and were no longer almost extirpated is the big word for it, almost becoming extinct. Well, up until that time, our people hunted this animal. But we used horses now. We'd still round them up and drive them off into the kill sites, but now we could do it faster. And the thing is, now we could cover our land a lot faster. And, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, we already knew our land intimately, but now when the horse came, we can travel over it a lot faster. If we look at the next image, then you see, uh, yeah, the different ways. We'd still be rounding them up on horseback. Uh, we'd be uh, herding them, chasing them on horseback, getting them into a herd. So maybe there was less use for the, the youthful runners as we had in the past. But that's not to say that there's still records, oral history of that happening right up, in the, up until 1870. So if we look at the next image, we've come to the end of our episode. Here you can see the buffalo being driven over a kill site by men on horseback. And so when the horse came, as I mentioned, it changed our way of life. And that was, in effect, the end of ito dasi mapi the days when we used dogs to move camp from point A to point B. So with that, that's pretty much the end of our program, the end of our broadcast, and I hope you enjoyed enjoyed sorry today's episode. Um, I want to point out, if you have any questions, you can comment down on Facebook, or you can uh, send them, send your questions to programs at Blackfoot Crossing. So with that, our other, uh, if you need to contact us, that's the best ways to do it. So remember, uh, COVID's still out there and other diseases that uh, aren't, aren't good for us. So be safe and be good and be good to one another. And with that, I'll see you next week.